Hello, and welcome to our second Camp Prosperity session on successful allyship and grassroots advocacy. We'll go ahead and get started in a couple of minutes, but in the meantime, please enjoy the short video from Prosperity Now on Baby Bonds. Welcome back again uh, to our Camp Prosperity session on grassroots advocacy, successful allyship and grassroots advocacy. Uh, to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started, this webinar is being recorded and will be mailed to registrants and available online within one week. All webinar attendees are muted to ensure sound quality. To ask a question or share your thoughts at any time, you can type into the text box of your GoToWebinar control panel. And if you experience any technical issues, email gotomeeting at prosperitynow.org. And we wanna make sure that you're getting the most out of today's call. Join from a quiet space, uh, grab a coffee or snack and settle in. Engage with us, send us your questions and comments as you listen. Tweet with us on Twitter using the hashtag Camp Prosperity and reflect on ways to apply what you learned today to your own work. And with that, I will kick things over to my colleague, Vanna. Great, thanks so much, Dara. Uh, welcome back everyone to uh, week two of Camp Prosperity. Uh, if you were with us two weeks ago, you know that we kicked off the series by talking about who and what excuse me, who and how to engage for change. This week, we are shifting focus a little bit to talk about successful allyship and how to get the right people on board to strengthen your advocacy efforts. Uh, we'll share best practices for identifying potential 
uh, advocacy partners uh, for agenda setting, research, excuse me, sharing resources, uh, and how to move from uh, issues to action. So that's a little bit what, excuse me, about what we'll be talking about today. Um, and then on the next slide, you'll see here our uh, full Camp Prosperity webinar series. Like I mentioned last week, we talked about uh, mapping influence, understanding who to who and how to engage. You see this week's uh, webinar. And then in two weeks, we'll close out the series by talking uh, advocating for e equity-centered policy. So I hope that you all will stay with us through all three webinars. Um, it should be a very great series that we've got lined up for you all. Uh, and as you all know, if you joined us last week, you know that we always want Camp Prosperity to feel as interactive as possible. Um, and to achieve that, we've included several ways for you all to win prizes throughout the series. Uh, during each session, we'll award a prize to the top tweeter. Um, so if you have Twitter, use the hashtag Camp Prosperity to get involved. Uh, and there you can go ahead and flip the next slide. Um, so live tweet using the hashtag Camp Prosperity. Uh, let us know what you're hearing, uh, any interesting quotes that you're hearing from us, our speakers, uh, how you are relating to what's being said. Tweet that out. Uh, we'll also do two pop quizzes today uh, for an, uh, an opportunity to win a prize. I'll ask a question. Uh, the first person to type the correct answer into the questions box will win a prize. Um, and then if by completing our post webinar survey, you'll also have a chance to win a prize. And we will follow up with you after the session if you are our uh, prize winner for the post uh, webinar survey. And so joining us today, uh, our speakers today, we have Prosperity Now's very own Fran Rosebush Baylor, who serves as our Vice President for Partnerships, Field Engagement and Policy. Karen Burry, who is the Senior Associate for Grassroots Impact at Results and Marquita Robertson, who is the Executive Director of the Collaborative North Carolina, who is a, a Prosperity Now community champion. We are really grateful that these three speakers could lend their time and expertise today to talk about grassroots partnerships and allyships. Um, and moving along to the agenda, um, similar to last week's uh, format, if you were with us, uh, we're not gonna do a poll question this week, but Fran will start off by talking about some, by giving you all some tools for effective collaboration. She's got a great presentation lined up for you. Uh, after Fran's presentation, we will have a fireside chat with Marquita and Karen to talk su successful allyship, what that looks like in their work. Uh, and then we'll close out by having a group discussion and Q&A, uh, answer some of your questions. Uh, and like I mentioned, we'll do some poll questions, additional opportunities for you all to engage as well. And as I mentioned earlier, we do want you all to be involved on Twitter. I'm gonna give you uh, one, two prompts throughout today's webinar. My first prompt here is uh, just so you all have some things that you can be tweeting about throughout uh, today's session. What issues would you like to partner with local organizations on? So if you want to go ahead and start tweeting, uh, answer that question, use our hashtag Camp Prosperity. Like I said, we'll award a prize to the top tweeter at the end of today's webinar. So with that, I will um, turn it over to Fran Rose Bush Baylor. Uh, who, like I mentioned, will begin today's webinar by talking tools for effective collaboration. So Fran. All right, thank you, Vanna. And thank you, Vanna, for being our lead camp counselor and uh, coordinating us through this series. And thank you, Dara and Oliver, for driving the shit behind the, behind the scenes. Um, it's wonderful to be with all of you today to talk about advocacy. Um, as Vanna mentioned, I work with our partnerships, field engagement, and policy teams at Prosperity Now um, and have been engaged in our community engagement and mobilization efforts since I've been with our organization for about eight years. Prior to that, I was working on local collaboratives and coalitions in, in Texas. So let's go to the next slide. What I'm going to be talking about, so thank you all for completing the registration questions when you signed up for the series. So your responses to those questions informed the discussion you'll hear later today and the presentation, the tools and tips that I'll be going over. So tried to pull together as many resources and ideas and concepts that could address the areas of interest that we heard from you in those, in those registration questions around coalitions or campaigns or collective efforts to advance advocacy. Um, I will be moving very quickly through these tools and, and tips. And so just so everyone knows, we are we have the ability to share the recording and resources after today's webinar. And so if there's questions or things that you're like, oh, I want to see that tool again. Can you, can I rewatch this recording? Um, the answer is yes, we can share that with you. So if we go to the next slide. Before I dive in, I also wanted to just state that 
I will either use the word coalition or collective advocacy effort to talk generally, though there's many terms that could be used to talk about these efforts. So some people might be working in coalitions or you might call it a collaborative. Um, you may have a membership association where you're actually paying dues or an affiliate of an organization that's doing advocacy. Um, you may have a campaign that is on a specific policy or goal and time limited. Um, some groups are working on movement-oriented networks around larger social movements, referral networks, people have formal partnerships, so there's lots of terms that can be used. So as I'm talking today, if I use the word coalition or group, really I'm, I'm speaking to collective advocacy efforts generally. All right. Let's dive in. So this resource is adapted from the TCC group in the California Endowment. We've used this for years um, and I adapted it. So the list on the left, left is what came from that resource and it's been altered a little bit. And then I added the question and I think these are questions and things to think about, areas to pay attention whenever you're doing collective action because it can help ground and focus the work. So the first part, making sure there's a shared purpose and vision. So why are we coming together? What is the need? What's the community need? Who's raising this community need? What is the difference that we're seeking to make? What, is, what, what difference or what impact would actually have an effect that what we're seeking? Um, what are the common outcomes? So if we are coming together to talk about, you know, fines and fees or um, rising housing costs or, or you know, debt in a, in a certain community. So what are these goals that our group is actually coming together and how, how are we, what, are, what is it that we are actually going to be marking ourselves working towards? Clear value proposition, it's always important if you are having collective advocacy effort to be able to state why is a coalition needed or why is a group needed or why is a campaign needed to achieve the outcomes and goals? Why, why is collective action going to be more effective in your goals than working siloed or working with one or two groups? Um, having a strategically engaged membership. So asking yourself when you're coming together, do we have the right people at the table? Another important question to step back and ask is, who is not at the table, who should be? When we're thinking about the community perspective and we're raising these issues, are there certain areas of expertise, experiences, lived experiences, community members, rep neighborhoods, representatives that, or power, think about influence, whatever it is that you might need, asking yourself, who is, who is at the table currently? Are these the right people? And who is not at the table, who should be? Formalized structure and procedures. This is, it's important for people just to know how to engage. So if you have a campaign or a group or a coalition or whatever it might be, a collaborative, if you're trying to build it and bring more people, or a network, if you're trying to bring more people into your network, it's important for them to know, well, how, how do I show up? Are there monthly meetings I can attend? Is there a listserv I should talk on? How do you use the listserv? So being able to lay out, this is how we interact and this is how people can engage with our group. Core leadership, so basically this means someone has to be able to move the work forward. So we can have a collective we, but at the end of the day, there's gotta be a responsibility of someone who's taking notes, making actions and, and you know, scheduling meetings, making sure that the work is moving forward. And, and finally, asking yourself, do you have or have you outlined a transparent decision-making processes? Whenever we're doing advocacy, you know there's always times that you have to have questions that come to you like, oh, this agency over here wants to align with us. They have a common goal, but they have questionable moral practices. They may not align with our values. Do we, and do we bring them into our group or not? Or, oh, we want to advance this policy, but they're asking us to make, um, you know, an adjustment to it. Is that something that we're actually willing to do? Or are we willing to make that compromise? There, there needs to be a clear process about how these decisions are made that's transparent so when people are a part of the group, they have that common understanding. Next slide. So another thing that's important to just state is that if you want to mobilize, you must listen and center community needs and perspectives. So groups are effective, advocacy efforts are effective when they reflect community needs and priorities. So another important thing to ask is, 
when you're starting out an initiative, you're coming together to take action, what is it that is, is, is grounding your work? Is there a community concern? Is there something that's coming up through data or lived experience that people are sharing in, in you know, community gatherings? Or, or you know, what is, how are you listening and what is those, those concerns that are being raised? Is there an existing solution that is inadequate or non-existent? Perhaps there is a solution in place, um, but maybe that, that is, is inadequate. Um, and so you need to address it, improve it, or there's a need for a shared response to, to problems. Another important thing to pay attention to is opportunity and timing. So there may be a change in a political environment. All of a sudden, the local news stations are all talking about minimum wage and rising housing costs, or they're all talking about um, student loan debt, whatever. There might be something that's, that's moving that is in alignment with goals or priorities that you all are working on, and that can also spark collective action at that time. Next slide. So an important tool in advocacy work is building a theory of change. I you know um, this is something that we've probably been working on since you know grad school a long, long time ago. Uh, but the logic models, theory of change, lots of ways to talk about it. And I think they're general. It's kind of like, oh, I used to roll my eyes at them. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it's the best way. A theory of change can be the best way to just be able to clearly answer. Someone ask you, why are we doing this? how are we going to accomplish it and what will be different at the end of our actions um, oftentimes you know coalition things can be hard to fundraise for or hard to bring more people uh, more allies into the fold because we haven't been able to talk about or lay out well how, how are we engaging how are we going to accomplish our goal are there going to be metrics or ways for us to benchmark our milestones and our progress um, you know, what is going to be the short-term or long-term impacts of our work of coming together um, for that, this longer-term advocacy goal that we have around changing, influencing, informing, improving policies or stopping policies. So these, you know, tools, I'm going to share a couple of them. So we'll go to the next one. The, yes, this one is actually an old one. It's from the Assets and Opportunity Network, and I don't know how many um, of you on this call are familiar. The Assets and Opportunity Network is, is what we were convening with our, our partners around the country prior to the Prosperity Now community launching in 2016, so it's been about five years. Uh, but this is an example that shows a logic model, and it reads from bottom up, and it shares, it lays out the strategies, then the near-term, intermediate, long-term outcomes, and the ultimate goal. I think what stood out to me about this one is it shows how programs and policy can intersect to work towards common goals common goals. Um, I do think this one needs a lot more detail. It's meant to be very high level. Um, but I think, you know, one thing that, that we heard in or read in the registration questions was questions around, well, how do you bring service providers together with advocates? How does, um, if I'm doing programmatic work, I work at a nonprofit, how does that really relate to policy? How do I get engaged with policy? And it's so important that they are linked so if you are operating a savings program, if you're a financial coach, if you're working on the front lines, you have direct insight into speaking with community members. What are those barriers? What's happening? Where, uh, where are their breakdowns? Where are they not able to um, you know, access parts of the system? Where's the system broken from them? And that can inform policy that informs, that leads direct insights into policies that are needed. There's also the need for for service providers, practitioners, to understand the impacts of policies, because when policy decisions are made that impacts your funding, your programmatic funding, and it can impact your clients, their success, their ability to access what they need um, or to participate in, you know, in different economic ventures. And so it's really important um, to understand and, and think about in your community, how are we connecting service providers with our advocacy work? So let's go to the next example of a theory of change that we worked on with Connecticut, um, with, a, with a coalition in Connecticut, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago. It's been a while. Um, and they were wanting to do this, so bringing service providers and advocates together around the table for a statewide coalition. And how we did this exercise with them to build the theory of change was we started with the why. So if you start with the vision on the right side of the screen, this is the why. Why is this group coming together in Connecticut? Why is this, why does this, 
you know, they called themselves the steering committee. It's about 12 people that came together. Why are they coming together? What is it, what's gonna be different? And then we did the exercise of, we had all of them kind of do some sticky notes and put it, well, how? Like, what, what is it that, so how are we going to achieve that? What are the activities that this group could actually do as a statewide, as a statewide group in an effort? So they identified raising awareness, advocating for policy change, building member um, service and advocacy capacity, and connecting stakeholders to learning opportunities statewide and nationally. And then we did the exercise of then what's the change you seek to make? So the short-term outcomes are in one to two years. So if you do these, these activities, what will happen or what will be different in one to two years? That's your short-term outcomes. And then the long-term outcomes, that is what's gonna happen in three to five years. So three to five years from now, what will be different? Ultimately, how does that lead to the vision? So this is just an example, if it's helpful, um, we use these oftentimes to identify metrics for fundraising, to um, identify activities to bring people into the fold, or just to be able to talk about um, the collective advocacy efforts in general and how we're operating. If we go to the next tool, this is a power mapping tool. So another thing read in the registration questions where people had had questions and thoughts about, well, how do you know who to bring into your advocacy efforts and, and how do you do that? And this is one tool um, that we've used with, with groups where along the um, horizontal axis, I don't know if it actually shows, it's kind of cut off in my screen, but on the horizontal axis, it says down there, if you can't see it, alignment. And what we mean by alignment is their their priorities, goals, or work aligns with the objectives you're trying to accomplish. So if you're trying to work on um, increasing credit or reducing debt or raising minimum wage or increasing you know affordable housing options, whatever that is, it is their alignment with your objectives. And then on the vertical axis, helpful. So that's power, influence, resources. How helpful are they um, or could they be in helping you to achieve achieve your goals. So if you go to the next slide, this is an example of it actually being filled out. And if you keep clicking, we'll pull up, there's three circles. Yeah, there's one circle, two circles, and then three, perfect. So this shows once it's been mapped out, so you just put on sticky notes <clears throat> with your group, different partners, um, players in your space, in your community, and then you map them on alignment versus helpful or influence. And then those in the top right, so they have the most alignment with your issues and could have the most, be the most helpful, they have the most influence. Those are the people that you make priority for engagement. They're the ones you, you have coffee with or virtual coffee. Um, they're the ones that you're doing relationship building, you're trying to get to know their staff members, you're trying to build and form relationships with them. Um, those on the bottom right, they are aligned, but maybe they don't have as much time or resources or money or influence, whatever it might be. Don't forget about those individuals. Those are so important and crucial for power and numbers. Those are the individuals you want to make sure they're on board. They can sign on letters. They can go to um, Hill Days with you. They might, you know, those are the power and numbers individuals. And then you have, shall I to the left, the groups who maybe aren't as aligned, but could be, have, be very helpful. Those are the ones if you have, they take work, it takes work. If you have resources, you have time, you have volunteers, maybe you have a board member who says, how can I be helpful? And they have a connection. You send them to have a coffee or a virtual coffee with one of these groups. Uh, but that's a way to kind of prioritize your time and resources when thinking about building the, the coalition. It's just one tool example. The next slide talks about Effective coalitions are inclusive. So one thing to you know just make sure that we are stepping back and asking ourselves is are we valuing and respecting differences in cultural, economic, social, social and programmatic perspectives and experiences in the spaces that we are creating? So are we including and actively engaging and providing space and respect to members and partners that are reflective of the community served? Are we thinking about our uh, barriers to engagement? Does it take extra time? Do people need stipends? Are you know the times that you're holding meetings, are those stopping some people from engaging? Um, so really thinking about, are we being inclusive and creating a space for people to engage? Um, are your core values reflecting in the goals and priorities? And are you fostering a participatory environment? I think one thing that 
we have to can be guilty in if we're all moving really quickly is okay the backbone organization is driving the agenda they're setting up activities and they're sending out action alerts and everybody just take action um, what that can miss is the opportunity for everyone in your network or your coalition or your movement whatever you're trying to build to share their insights, their reflections, their thoughts on priority agenda items, their thoughts on, oh, connections or people they might know who have power, influence, whatever. It, this, it, it loses that opportunity to get that full benefit from your network. And so making sure you are thinking about ways to create a participatory environment with feedback loops. Let's go to the next slide. These ones will go pretty quickly too. Um, so there's, um, oh, the, I don't know, there's, that just got really big on my screen, but um, so moving coalition ideas into action. So um, coalition members, obviously we are coming together, groups, whatever we are, coalition though can be a, um, a word that maybe some people don't like. So group, collective action, whatever it is, your campaign, we are all coming together because we want to do something. And so um, I wanna just go to the next slide to share an example of how we built a structure with um, a coalition in Nevada or worked with them in a workshop to build out a structure with a coalition in Nevada to do this. Um, so this is a very in-depth theory of change, very elaborate, lots they wanted to accomplish. And this theory of change came out of an initial brainstorming session with their initial steering committee. Like this is a lot to accomplish. So if you go to the next slide, we said to them, okay, you're a new group coming together. What is it realistically that your group can do in the next six months, six months to a year, that you actually have resources you know you can accomplish and do in six months to a year? So they grade everything out and just highlighted three things, advocating, increasing some capacity through a training or two, and connecting people through some meetings. So if you go to the next slide, we said, okay, that's what you can do in the next six months months, what are the actual concrete activities that are going to help you accomplish those goals in the next six months? So if you look on the very left, you have, and thank you for the circles, Dara. Uh, you can kind of just move through those circles and bring them on the screen. Um, so you, they have host regional meetings. Um, so they were in, nor in Northern Nevada, Southern Nevada. They leveraged the, the old Asset Learning Conference, which is now the Prosperity Summit. So a national conference for people to learn. And then the last thing is they wanted to organize a legislative day at their state capitol. And so we said, okay, those are the things you're gonna do in the next six months. So what is the structure then for getting it done? So then if you go to the um, third column, structure for getting it done, you have, they had they did some numbers of committees, ad hoc planning committee, interim steering committee would be involved, they have a policy committee. So for them, that's what, if you go to the next, we just move on to the next slide. Go through all the circles. Thank you. Um, this came to them to be, well, this is the structure they needed to actually accomplish those things in the next six months. They had a part-time staff person who was actually responsible for organizing all of these committees for these meetings. They were the person who was actually moving the work forward and they dedicated a portion of their time to doing this. There was an interim volunteer steering committee of leaders across the state that came together and they made up these outreach committees, policy committees, and you know delegation to the national conference. This was just a short-term structure that they needed. And I think the point here was sharing that, you know, the structures that we put in place should reflect the work that we want to get done. They can be fluid and they can be nimble and they may change over time. And so they were gonna come back after their six months and say, okay, so what are we gonna do in the next year? And what structure might we, what are the concrete activities we wanna do and what structure might we need to do that? Next slide. Another thing is, I think all of us are into continuous learning, continuous improvement. And if we want to improve our collective efforts, our partnership efforts, the best thing to do is think about how you are closing your meetings with each other. So at the end of each meeting, one thing to, you know, a couple things to think about, review agreements, next steps and assignments. So at the end of the meeting, what did we say we were gonna accomplish? Who's going to do it? How are we gonna do it and by when? Write it down and make sure you have action items to send out. 
Two, identify topics and our goals for future meetings. The best way to shape agendas is to work with your group that's going to be a part of the meetings, the meeting before, to say, this is what we accomplished today. What do we want to do next month? What are some topics or things we need to, we need to be prioritizing for our next meeting and conversation? Um, obviously, there's going to be things that come up quickly with advocacy that you're going to need to make space for on an agenda that's timely, that may happen the day of or day before, um, but also the pre-planning helps. Do a meeting evaluation. This is the picture of a dot exercise we used to do where people could go and put the, how they evaluated the meeting and send out those action-oriented timely notes. And then finally, there's this next slide goes into talking about communication efforts. I think it's important with, with coalitions, we talk about you always need someone to do the work, that it's we're paying attention to communications. I think one thing that in collective efforts, if it's not a priority item, for the different organizations, it can be very easy to lose momentum and lose engagement. So having timely follow-up and action-oriented items, sharing relevant information that people in your network, people in your group, people in your coalition actually want to read, find valuable, um, are helpful resources for them, paying attention to what it is that you're sharing and how often that you're sharing it. And think about your content and frequency can vary by audience. So the next slide lays that out where um, if we go through the diagram, um, so you start with your close partners. Those are those could be people on your steering committee. It could be the five people in your community that all want to work on this, you know, increasing access to affordable housing, whatever your issue might be, minimum wage, um, uh, you know, debt traps, whatever those, you know, your issues might be locally. And those are the individuals that you may be talking with biweekly or monthly. Maybe you have a monthly engagement, you have meeting notes, opportunities that you're sharing with them to get involved in action items. Um, if things are moving very quickly around your policy item, maybe to meet biweekly. It can be fluid. Um, the next round of groups, and this is just an example. You don't have to take this directly. It's just supposed to be a, a tool or a tip that you could uh, you can adjust or apply as relevant. Um, allies, those might be people who have similar agenda items as you or similar priorities that could be helpful to your cause, but maybe they're not sitting at the table with you. Maybe they're not joining your, your partnership. Uh, but those are groups that you could, you know, somewhat frequently, maybe that's monthly, maybe that's bi-monthly, um, sharing opportunities and action items um, with them. And then finally, it's important to keep funders and policymakers, those you want to educate, aware of the work of your group. So maybe that's that's quarterly, maybe it's annually, whoever makes sense to you to share updates. You could highlight work of your partners. You could um, talk about what are your priority agenda items are. You could lift up stories happening locally that are reflective of your issues. Thinking about those communications for um, funders and policymakers or, or other stakeholders that could fit into that category. We go to the next slide. This is my last item before we transition to the fireside chatter to transition to Vanna. Is lastly wanted to share this. This is something that we have shared with different coalition partners over the years or had conversations about it because um, we know fundraising for coalition or partnership work or collaborative work um, or networks, movement-oriented networks, whatever it is that that it is that you're doing locally around grassroots advocacy, um, fundraising can be hard. Um, it can be hard to say, well, what are these concrete deliverables? I mean, we can't guarantee that maybe a policy would be passed or adopted or, um, or stopped, but there are other things, like in the theory of change we called out, that could be milestones or benchmarks or things that you can that you can be measuring and talking through. Um, and so what we've laid out here in terms of a fundraising pitch are kind of four things. So one, making sure you're very clear on the need for change. What does the data say? What are the community voices and experiences say about the issue that you're trying to affect? And what is the evidence that your group will drive this change? Has your group done similar work in the past? Have you, as certain, you know, groups in your community have changed? What is evidence that that your group will affect the change that you're laying out based on data and community experience? Two, why is your coalition the right vehicle for change? This is important if you're fundraising, why that, that value proposition? And this is where the theory of change can come into play. You know, say, showing that having an amplified voice, power in numbers, that the activities that you'll be engaging in, what are the short-term and long-term outcomes that you hope to affect? Um, and then being able to speak that to the funder's perspective. And so it's important. I think we always talk, you know, and, and 
um, you know, partnership work, mutual value. If I'm going to partner with you, what both of us need mutual value in order to spend our time and resources, which are so precious and strapped in nonprofit work, in order to partner together. And the same with with funders understanding the mutual value um, to each other, and you know, and and being able to clearly say the value that your group brings. Your group is doing valuable work. How do you talk about your work and the value that it is going to have for your community? Why is it important that your group's work exists? Um, and then components, being able to lay these out. Um, most of you, I'm sure a lot of you have done lots of fundraising thing at nonprofits. We all wear many hats. And so these may be um, givens for a lot of people, but sometimes just um, reiterating it can be helpful. So I will um, wrap up. I think the next slide just shows that basically this is another tool taken from, there's a resource from the TCC group and California Endowment called What Makes an Effective Coalition. We can share the link if it's helpful. Um, it's been a very helpful resource to me over the years, but one of the uh, charts that it had in there was the, the benefits and costs, pros and cons of working in collective advocacy action. Um, you know, there's definitely pros and cons, and we all know that working together. And so making sure that when your group is coming together, that the benefits outweigh the costs and that you have a clear value proposition about why you're coming together. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and actually, Vanna, turn it back over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Graham, for that great presentation. So many tools were shared. Um, throughout the presentation that I think is really valuable for folks on the on the uh, webinar this afternoon. This afternoon, I know that one of the challenges that we often hear from some of the partners, the local partners that we work uh, with is, you know, how do we go from knowing what the issue is in our community, you know, understanding some of the challenges to actually resolving it. Like how do we transition over to, act, excuse me, over to action? And I think one of the uh, ways to do that is is exactly what you laid out here is really having putting some structure to those thoughts um, developing a theory of change figuring out you know some sort of structure for getting it done both in the short and long term doing some power mapping to figure out who can help who will realistically be there to help and and, and who offers what resources um, and then and then you know getting those next steps on paper as well so I really appreciate you laying that all out um, wanted to do a quick pop quiz before we move on um, to our fireside chat this afternoon. And again, you all keep tweeting. If you are hearing things that you find valuable, tweet them out. Um, but for our pop quiz uh, this afternoon um, is a fill in the blank. Um, if you all will fill in the blank for me. A blank is a planning tool that helps your coalition develop your strategy and clearly explain or illustrate coalition concepts and approach for key stakeholders. That was a little bit long, so I'll say it again. A blank is a planning tool that helps your coalition develop your strategy and clearly explain or illustrate coalition concepts and approach for key stakeholders. Let's see what we have here. The answer was a uh, theory of change. And Jody, I cannot pronounce your last name, but I see your answer here first. Jody Boisbert, I think that's how you pronounce your last name. Uh, if you will chat one of us your um, your email address, that would be great. We will send you out a prize from Prosperity Now. Uh, moving along here, I want to give you all another Twitter prompt before I get us going into our panel discussion this afternoon. Uh, our second Twitter prompt is, what are some goals your organization hopes to achieve by building successful community partnerships? So if you want to tweet at us, use the hashtag Camp Prosperity, but talk about some of the goals that you are hoping to achieve by uh, building successful partnerships, allyships in your community. So with that, I want to dive into our uh, panel discussion this afternoon where we'll talk successful allyships. Again, I uh, introduced Karen and Marquita earlier, so no need to reintroduce them. They will uh, talk about their work in just a second, but I'll dive right into our first question this afternoon. Um, and I believe, Karen, this first question, I'm gonna direct at you. Um, for starters, let's just talk about general partnerships, allyships, coalitions, whatever you, term you want to use. Um, but what does it look like when those work well? Give us an example of, um, you know, of what of a partnership that you uh, were involved in to push your advocacy efforts, and what about that made it successful? Thank you, Vanna, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, so I would like to share um, next slide, please, if you will. Maybe the next two slides. 
Um, so I, I work with Results and we're a 41-year uh, grassroots advocacy organization uh, working with everyday people who lobby on global health, education, economic development, and uh, domestic anti-poverty legislation. Um, over the years, Results has had a number of uh, successful partnerships. Um, even before my time, they actually started as a grassroots uh, volunteer in 2016. Um, and I'll actually highlight one of the partnerships um, with uh, a representative of the National Low Income Housing Coalition um, that I made at my time um, working with Results Miami. Um, some other partnerships we've had have include um, Action, the Global Advocacy Partnership um, with works, um, who works with locally rooted advocates uh, and organizations across five continents, advocating on global health, the response to the pandemic, um, and working together collectively to um, bring an end to diseases like tuberculosis and malnutrition. Um, currently, uh, now we have a focus on uh, ensuring equitable access to vaccines. Uh, together Women Rise, this is an organization that we've partnered with um, that has uh, 500 chapters all over the country. Uh, we work with them to support local members um, in developing advocacy efforts around closing the gender gap. Um, so as it affects women and girls, but around, again, global health and education. Um, so some of the things that Fran had mentioned earlier, just even though there are multiple organizations, just alignment with um, some of the issues that overlap with um, the issues that results advocate for. And um, most recently, we developed a partnership as an affiliate group with the National Peace Corps Association. Um, this way, we aim to work with Return Peace Corps volunteers um, who are passionate about continuing uh, to make an impact in countries that they've served in around uh, global anti-poverty. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that on both the national level and grassroots level, um, volunteers are working with local organizations and community partners in order to move um, their advocacy forward. Um, so an example of this um, in early 2020, just before the pandemic hit, um, we at the Miami Group for Results were working primarily on global issues, but decided to expand to uh, working on affordable housing since it was such a prevalent issue in our community before the pandemic and only, you know, got exacerbated since. Um, we had a chance encounter with um, the head of, uh, sorry, a member of the National Income Housing Coalition and a head of her tenant association, Shalonda Rivers, um, who's part of NAT. Uh, we immediately connected just based on our values that we both believe that there should be a right to quality, safe and affordable housing for residents here in Miami-Dade County and, and all over the country. And uh, she had been working long and hard to fight for her, um, her tenants in her community on rental assistance and just on basic, you know, safety and, and sanitary housing conditions. Um, so we worked with her initially just as a, a coalition partner, um, just to help highlight the importance of not only things like um, universal vouchers, but just to expand that conversation on what quality uh, housing looks like and how um, everyone really deserves to have that no matter, you know, what the, the, they are on the income scale. Um, we've advocated with her at her representative's office uh, to Senator Scott and Rubio, um, and her perspective has helped to bring insights on possible solutions um, and um, for us even to consider um, helping to support things like the tenant empowerment bill, which is centering um, on tenants to provide them a pathway to speak um, to the representatives um, in HUD assistant properties. Um, and increase enforcement of HUD standards across all federally assisted um, housing. Um, so our partnership, though it just started in 2020, it's in this early stages, but to me, it's been a success just reflecting on some of the, the things that Fran talked about. Um, we are starting off with the basic, oh, sorry, next slide, please. We're starting off with the basic conditions of success as to forging a common agenda, um, to make sure that we're both on the same page when we're facing the problem, that we share a common understanding of the problem. Um, having that is necessary to um, clearly define the vision and set the goals that we want to achieve, right, and to uh, achieve common ground. Um, we both have a shared measurement in terms of the effectiveness of, of our, our work, who we're lobbying to, um, how often we're contacting them, um, how we're communicating with them, um, and just making sure that we have um, shared metrics together. Um, having mutually reinforcing activities, 
Um, it's really important for partners to develop a plan of action that's outlining um, reinforcing activities, identifying ways that you can work together, and how everybody is contribut contributing to meeting the collective goal. Um, having com um, continuous communication, both on a formal and informal basis, um, everyone seems to be getting a lot of emails. So of course we do send email communications. This is a, a general um, way of updating, but we also just check in with each other. It's been, you know, 2020 was quite a tough year for everyone. So just those personal um, connections, I think are important to check in um, with your partners and just have that established um, piece of communication in order to develop trust, because trust is really important. And um, as Fran mentioned, um, it's really important to have that backbone of support. Um, it's foundational to making sure that you're, you're able to move forward in any things that you set out to do. Um, it can take on different forms, but you need that effective level of leadership um, to play a role in moving things forward. Um, so those are my perspectives in terms of what um, would bring a, a successful partnership forward. Great, thank you, Karen. And uh, Marquita, I don't know if you had anything to add there, so I'll, I'll pause for a second because I was gonna, go ahead. Hi, it's Marquita. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you today and really excited um, about the conversation that's taken place thus far. I wanted to echo um, some of the things that Karen brought up about partnerships we, um, the collaborative also, um, also provides all of our coalition members, if they're interested, with an AmeriCorps VISTA. And this is a full-time paid VISTA that serves on site for a year to help build capacity within their organization. And I'm pretty sure that mo there are a lot of nonprofits on the call. And I know one thing that nonprofits struggle with is capacity, resources, and people being there. And so, this is um, the partnership with AmeriCorps has been great. Over the past few years, we've placed more than 100 VISTAs across the state um, with nearly um, 60 nonprofits to support their work. And um, it's really exciting to see the impact and just to see what, you know, what a small, you know, what a small, you know, part of our work is how much it's impacting um, our anti-poverty efforts in North Carolina. Um, we've also um, have some other partnerships that are pretty cool, and the other one is with um, the Center for Responsible Lending. They um, are already doing much of the advocacy work that our members are interested in, and the Collaborative is um, a smaller organization, while the Center for Responsible Lending is a larger organization and has a big communications team and um, a big policy team, and we're able to glean from their resources and to share with share their resources with our members as soon as it happens. And that's been very, very helpful. Um, the collaborative, um, as a result of a lot of the things that happened during COVID-19, has most recently partnered with the North Carolina Bankers Association to launch a statewide bank on program. And through this partnership with the Bankers Association, um, we're going to have the reach and the scale and the resources to do this. And that, you know, that would not have been made possible without these partnerships. And so, um, you know, I would say that the collaborative and a lot of organizations that are doing coalition work, they run off of partnerships. And it's a critical part of the work that we do. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna move along to the, the next question here. And I also wanna remind folks in the audience to go ahead and start putting your questions in the questions box. If you had qu earlier questions for Fran, uh, go ahead and start uh, typing them in as well as any additional questions for Marquita and Karen, and we'll answer them at the end of uh, this panel discussion here in a few minutes. Um, but transitioning a, a bit, thinking about the space that many of our organizations work in, this anti-poverty space, um, and our focus on issues like affordable housing, uh, income supports, food security. Um, in this work, what organizations have you all found to be unlikely allies and sort of how did those partnerships come to be? And Karen, I'll kick it over to you just so that someone starts us off here. Sure, sure. Um, so it's interesting because when I first started as an advocate, um, I, I didn't necessarily think that um, 
certain groups would be um, sharing kind of my values and what I what I was supporting around um, you know issues like affordable housing or um, economic uh, tax policy for for lower income folks. So I was actually surprised to find that a lot of these times. Um, though we see the partisanship, um, poverty itself is not a partisan issue. Um, it really touches on everyone, um, you know, depending on, on, on all sides of the, the kind of political scale. Um, so now I think it's really just a question of focusing on um, the issue itself and how it's affecting people um, and, and try to map that out into finding effective partnerships. Um, actually, if you go to the next slide, I can share um, a bit of, of what that mapping um, looks like in terms of finding um, effective partners. Um, so it takes some brainstorming to, to think on a particular issue in the organization to find um, allyship with people that you may not have considered. Um, so through this tool, um, the, we work with results volunteers to kind of help them in, in mapping partnerships within their own um, local community networks. Um, so at the center, you would start by identifying a targeted issue, for example, affordable housing, and then you would ask some, um, some prompts and some questions around that um, on who cares about that issue. So which businesses or nonprofits or educational institu institutions are studying the issue or, or have folks that are affected by it? Um, who experiences it and, and how does that issue affect them and how do you include them um, on working this, uh, on a solution to that issue. Um, how does the local government um, show up when, when we're working on issues like affordable housing? What are they doing to address homelessness in the community? Um, and of course, um, due to the pandemic, we've seen um, a lot of media coverage around that in the local paper, um, on the news. So how, how are you um, connecting with those folks who, who care about the issue? Um, if you go to the next slide, I'll show you what that looks like once we've mapped that out. Um, local colleges and universities who are studying that issue um, usually are a great way to even start because they're the ones that hold the data, that they're working with different you know, partners in the community. Um, I know um, through Florida International University, for example, that they have a, a great data bank of information that has helped us in our advocacy and has helped us to connect with other organizations that we didn't um, even know about who are studying in, in specific communities like farming communities in South State, things of that nature. Um, parents who are having challenges in finding stable houses for themselves and their children. So just people you know, within our network that, that we may run into who are um, dealing with affordable housing issues. You know, How are we including them in the solution on that? And, and how do we make that connection between these actions that we have um, you know, that we're taking to our um, members of Congress or that we're writing about in, in op-eds in the paper, how are we putting them um, first and center into those issues and framing it in a way that, you know, that they're being a part of the solution and empowering them that way. Um, teachers, educators, you know, home became a school during the last year. So of course, you know, um, there's plenty of educators who are concerned with their students having the ability to access um, safe and decent housing. Um, healthcare providers as well, if patients need to follow um, strict at-home care, at care plans and they don't have stable housing, or just dealing um, with the stress of not having stable housing and how that affects their health. Um, you may not consider those, so in that sense is how I think of unlikely allies, not that people don't necessarily care about the issue, but if you expand a little bit on um, how people um, are affected by that issue, then it's a way to help um, think about others that you can bring to the table. Great, thank you, Karen. And I, Marquita, I don't know if you had anything to add, but I'm going to pause this to move on to the third question that I have here for the sake of time. Um, one of the common challenges that we hear from local organizations is, as I mentioned before, this difficulty in going from issue to action. Um, and I think Fran laid it out well earlier when she talked about, um, you know, the first step is is knowing exactly what you're solving for or identifying some of the potential priorities that your organization that your organization has. Um, so in order for a partnership and allyship, a coalition to be successful, um, organizations have to be on the same page about their priorities and the agenda. What advice do you have for folks for developing a shared agenda for co for coming together for agreeing on a shared agenda to move forward? 
So it's Marquita and I will, um, I'll take that. And I'll just start off by saying that your policy or your shared agenda should be collaborative, hence the shared agenda. And it should also be reflective of your coalition and your membership. Um, we set an annual policy agenda at our winter meeting. And during that meeting, coalition members share or workshop what they're interested in. Um, the organizers or the steering committee, as Fran um, mentioned in her previous presentation, we're generally pretty well versed in most of the issues that come up and are able to facilitate meaningful discussions around these priorities. There may be um, members there that are not as familiar with manufactured housing, but they are very familiar with, um, with payday lending. And so someone there to provide some context during what we call this um, agenda setting meeting is always helpful. And from there, we elevate our top five or four or five um, policies that we want to put a little bit more support around. Um, and through this process, everybody has input. Um, everybody, um, you know, it is very organic. People are just talking. And it's also a good opportunity for the organizers or the steering committee to get an idea of what folks are interested in, even if what they're interested in doesn't make it to our shared agenda, at least we know as organizers that if something comes across our desk or if there's something, if there's a way to collaborate or to put some support behind a certain issue that someone's interested in, we'll already know that and it'll be on our radar. Um, and we're able to flag relevant information. And so this, um, this process has been very helpful in getting everybody on the same page and in sync with our um, shared agenda. And I think you we needed to um, advance the slide. Thank you, Marquita. And yeah. yes, there is a visual to go along with uh, with your response there. And Karen, I'm going to pause too because I don't know if you wanted to respond, but I want to move us along for the sake of time here. Um, and I'm going to direct this question to you. Um, and it's one that that we hear um, a lot from our network, a lot of responses um, to our registration questions um, alluded to wanting to know a little bit more about this. Um, but just, you know, many organizations have trouble engaging clients and community members in advocacy. Um, what are some strategies for getting communities involved in these efforts? Thanks, Fana. Um, I was actually just responding to a question in the chat, um, and I believe this may have been in a similar nature to that on getting um, volunteers engaged. Like, even if you're having a meeting and they may make a commitment, but then it doesn't follow through, um, at times um, it's, it's really hard for people to kind of step out of um, their everyday commitments and things. So um, you want to just make sure to open up enough opportunities for them to engage. Like, for example, if you're having the meeting, like try taking the actions at those meetings um, so that, you know, collectively they feel supported. Um, a lot of times if people are doing this for the first time, they don't have, you know, the confidence um, on taking actions on their own. So being able to do that with others um, at meetings where they can get advice, they can, you know, have questions answered or they can just kind of shadow and get that support um, hands-on is really helpful. Um, and, and the next slide, I actually have um, some questions that you may want to ask yourself around community involvement. Um, the, the key is really to keep engagement and communications um, consistent, just understanding that there's an ebb and flow to dealing um, with volunteers um, and just in, in different um, individuals that are, that are involved. There may be some seasons where you won't see a lot of engagement. I'm thinking particularly last year. Um, just with a lot going on um, with people, you know, being quarantined, being ha having to stay home, um, do schooling with their children from home. There was a lot of um, stressors and commitments around that time. Um, at the same token, you may find some folks um, who aren't normally collected, uh, connected, have some time at home, um, you know, and may be able to, to engage um, online and do virtual actions, virtual lobby meetings, things like that. So it's just, again, important to be open and flexible. Um, especially when you're working with people with lived experience of poverty um, that are, are seeking, you know, they're, they're living the experiences of the, the issues that we seek to resolve. Um, so you, you want to make sure that you're keeping them engaged in this solution, keeping them 
um, empowered and seeking those relationships, which are not transactional, you know, not just kind of bringing in them in to share, you know, a story during a lobby meeting or to, to relive trauma and think about, you know, the trauma of that experience. It's really a situation where you want to be sure to create um, equitable partnerships and, and make sure everyone is empowered. Um, part of that too is addressing barriers to uh, involvement. Um, a lot of folks sometimes may have, um, you know, technology or access to Wi-Fi issues or access to transportation that's lacking. Um, they, they may have um, some odd work hours or if you're having your meetings kind of during the day during work hours or not able to attend. So these are all kind of considerations that you have to make and be able to uh, be flexible around in order to have um, people involved. Awesome. Uh, another question here, I'm going to turn it over to you, Marquita. Um, but we all know that we are in this era of COVID and virtual work. Um, how have you been able to ma maintain communication with partners um, and just sort of, you know, keep things flowing along? Um, so maintaining communication both with partners as well as engaging lobby or excuse me, engaging policymakers in just this era of, of virtual work. So like the rest of the world, the collaborative has over leveraged our digital communications. Um, we early on in the pandemic, we hosted a webinar on how to engage policymakers virtually. And what we shared with our members was that it is a lot easier than folks think it is. And social media actually makes, you know, it presents us with this new access to policymakers that we didn't have before. You can add a policymaker and they may respond back to you directly as opposed to having to get on the phone or schedule a meeting or something like that. So um, there have we've seen a lot of engagement in social media with um, policymakers. Um, we've also moved for our membership. We've had, we've like everyone has moved our meetings to virtual. Um, and we support them through webinars that um, help to make that if to help them through the transition and also to keep them um, engaged, similar to your camp prosperities. Um, we're also intentional about meet, reaching out to members more directly than we have during normal times. If there is an issue or um, an opportunity to connect with them, as opposed to sending an email to schedule a call, um, to schedule some time to discuss. Um, I have, and so have some of our, um, of my colleagues, have started calling people. And it seems very basic and out of the ordinary, but how often does someone actually call you? And you may not like that. How, how um, you know, how often does that happen? Most of the time we get all of our um, correspondence or updates from um, an email. But um, calling our members who I generally see um, seven or eight times a year and have a chance to talk with them online um, presents us with opportunities that we have not had since the early parts of 2020. And I think that that has been critical. And also, we have also um, leveraged, um, as a result of the pandemic, a lot of pass through funding that we were able to support our members with um, different opportunities. And that has also, um, you know, allowed us to engage better with our members. Great question. And great response. I laughed a little bit when you said over leverage Zoom and these other <laughs> virtual tools. We can definitely relate to that. Um, final question here, and then we want to hear from um, our audience, our campers, with some questions that they have. I'm, I keep seeing questions come into the questions box, so I'm really excited to see what folks want to know. But final question from me here, um, and I, I think I'm going to direct it to uh, Karen, and then Marquita, if you want to chime in as well. But when it comes to grassroots advocacy, we know that no one single organization has all the answers. We know that we need to lean on organizations, other organizations, excuse me. Um, how has leveraging partnerships helped your organization's advocacy efforts? Um, thanks, Fanna. Um, again, I think we just need to really emphasize that no single organization has all the answers. And I will definitely agree that no single organization can accomplish um, any of the anti-poverty work we're trying to do alone. Um, if you would just turn quickly to the next slide. Um, so results over the last 
um, 41 years, um, has had over 5,500 face-to-face meetings with members of Congress, published over 14,000 pieces of media, LTEs, letters to the editor, um, op-eds, um, and had 160,000 um, meetings and uh, phone conversations with congressional staff. All of this is really reflective of having really great cutting edge uh, partnerships. If you turn to the next slide, um, formal partnerships and affiliates in more than 20 countries, coordinated network of advocates um, all working together. Um, we actually, I learned um, as now I joined the staff of results uh, a few months ago, I'm learning a lot of the history of, organization, of the organization. Um, previously, we referred to our volunteer advocates as partners. Like we consider all of them um, really um, instrumental to the work that uh, we're doing. And even as we leverage that on the organizational basis, it's really not possible um, without them. Um, it's important um, as we work together to set bold targets together. For example, on uh, the work with tuberculosis, um, our director went out and said, no, we should be asking for you know a billion dollars um, for tuberculosis um, research and funding to end the disease. Um, that seemed to um, have had a lot of resources taken away since the onset of COVID. Um, and that, of course, some, some organizations weren't supporting that. So being able to work together um, and create that clear agenda together, develop the advocacy strategy around it, um, I think is really important. And just also a reflection of, a, of our diversity and, and working together in an equitable way. We do prioritize equity in our work. Um, it's at the heart of the policies that we promote, and, and we definitely make sure that we're actively um, pushing uh, back against any um, discrimination or, or anti-oppression. It's actually the core of, of our values. Um, and we want to make sure that government policies are prioritizing people um, that are most likely getting left out as we, we aim to um, develop our, our strategies around anti-poverty. Great. And uh, Marquita, anything to add on your end? No, I think she did a good job talking about partnerships. Great. Well, thank you both for um, participating in our panel discussion this afternoon. Some great insights you provided um, just to provide context to what Fran was saying earlier. Um, and so now I want to shift a bit, transition, and open it up to our audience. I know that we've had questions and comments flowing. Um, throughout today's discussion. So I'm gonna turn to the Q&A box and uh, start reading off some questions from our audience. Um, and you all please continue to submit questions and I'll, and I'll read them. Uh, we had a question from Jody earlier. Um, what, what recommendations do you have for engaging partners in that direct work? Uh, many of our partners come to the meetings, but when it comes down to accomplishing the action items, no one volunteers, any thoughts? I'll add it. I'll, I'll jump into that one. Um, this is Marquita, and doesn't that sound just like life? <laughs> um, I would say um, the same as, you know, we all have um, that issue. And what I always do is when partners or when someone is pretty passionate about something and they're pushing for something, I um, I ask them, you know, can you help with this or, you know, how can you support this and that sort of thing and I, I throw the ball back in their court and um you know no matter what size organization you are or what your capacity is there is something that you can contribute and so um i think that you know knowing your membership and where they have strength is helpful in kind of helping them find their way and how they can contribute or take on um some of the work, but I, um, when I first moved into this role, that was um, a big thing that a lot of folks had really great ideas, but no one had the time to do it. And so um, it was tough, but I feel a lot better um, after meetings when I have um, things that I wouldn't say delegated, but when there are action items and there are people's names besides Marquita, besides the action items. Akita, I hear that. Um, this is Fran. Yeah, agree with, with all of that. And I, um, there's kind of four, building on what you shared, I think there's kind of four things I, I ask myself when thinking about if, okay, people aren't 
responding or, or taking on action items. And they're similar to the slide, I think that Karen shared earlier, highlighting community involvement. Um, the one thing I, I ask myself is, so the people at the table, are their priorities aligned with the agenda that we've laid out? So first is, did they help shape the goals and the direction that we're headed in? You know, do we have their buy-in? Because um, sometimes, you know, we can join an agenda or join a group or coalition or, you know, an advocacy effort because we have tangentially interested or we think it's a good idea to join, but maybe it's not a priority, so we're not going to put our time there. So I think the one thing is making sure prior to their line two, are the people who are in the group uh, that you're asking to take things on, are they empowered to say yes? So do you have the right people? Um, you know, do they need to ask for, you know, approval, the you know, authority, are they decision makers? So just making sure the people who are the group, um, they, they, they are empowered and they feel empowered to, to take action. Um, three, are they in agreement on these action items and these next steps? So are they clear? Are they like these things that we think we should be doing? Did they help, you know, uh, did they help come up with these solutions? Um, so just making sure they're they're in agreement on them. And then fourth is, yeah, people are, are time strapped. If we're working in a nonprofit or an advocacy group or organization, we, you know, if they're taking on something really big, we have competing priorities, maybe we don't have time. And so another thing that we can do is turn um, outward and ask, our group members, how can they engage? So if you're not able to, you know, commit time outside of attending monthly meetings or doing some sign-on letters, responding to emails, um, so time is one, can you, are there some money? Can you offer space as our in-kind support? Do you have connections you can help facilitate networks? Do you have a distribution list we could tap into? So also asking people um, how they can engage that can be incorporated in future action items. Great, thank you both for those responses. Um, and just to remind folks, uh, the questions box is in your GoToWebinar panel. You can see it there, screenshot. Uh, so feel free to continue to drop your questions. I have another one here, um, and I know that I'm gonna butcher this name, but I believe it's Kianali. Um, you had a question, what about cultural practitioners in the community? I'm not sure what that was in response to, but if you want to type uh, more content, excuse me, provide more context in the chat, or if someone wants to just take that on, I just wanted to read it verbatim, but I know that you were asking what about cultural practitioners in the community? I don't know if you were asking if they would make great partnerships, how to approach them, but uh, yeah, please provide more context. And if anyone, um, Oh, I, I see here, I think it was in reference to um, partners to engage on an issue. It was in response to community engagement. Yes, if any uh, of our panelists have a response to that at all, feel free to chime in. Uh, hearing nothing, I, I think I will answer this question in a different way because, uh oh, I, did someone unmute themselves? Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to, you, you can go ahead, Vanna. I just wanted some clarification on what was meant by uh, cultural practitioners in that context. But if you if you have a response, go, you can go ahead. I think I was just going to, um, I guess, build off of that question and 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 you know, as something that Fran talked about earlier is just uh, making sure that partnerships and coalitions are inclusive and thinking about people from different cultural backgrounds, um, any additional tips and strategies for um, for bringing those people into the table. And it looks like there's some clarification in the chat box that the question was in response to the community engagement piece. Um, and in this political climate, looking at, at, those, at those particular people to be at the table, um, cultural practitioners.
Yeah, I think, I mean, this is, this is Fran. I think when we're, we're thinking about who to bring at the table, sometimes we can limit ourselves to kind of the usual people that we go to. Um, so I really appreciate this questions. And so, you know, just thinking about, I guess when we're thinking about who to bring to the table, it's, it goes back to kind of that power mapping in a way, but also, um, you know, the alignment piece on the on the bottom. So, is there an alignment there? Are we working towards common goals? Um, and is there a unique perspective or value that these groups mutual value? Is there perspectives or value that these groups would bring to the conversation or the work, but also that they would get, you know, out of it. So is this helping with, you know, their priorities? And if there's an alignment there, um, I think, you know, pursuing different partnership opportunities can open up conversations and networks that perhaps we didn't think we had before. Um, so it's not directly speaking to cultural practitioners, but just I think in broadly in the partnership sense, I think asking ourselves, you know, it, you know, we, we do this at, at Prosperity Now, I was thinking like, oh, you know, if we talk to the healthcare um, providers, you know, there's educational groups, there's childcare advocacy, and there's lots of different groups or agencies or organizations out there that aren't maybe the usual people who are working economic justice or asset building or financial well-being space, but do really care about our issues and could, and can see the value of moving things forward and add value and momentum to issues that we care about um, and so opening up those doors and having conversations and perhaps having a virtual coffee to explore our partnership um, can be a good idea great thank you fran um, anything to add there karen I am in complete agreement with that. It's just really a focus on highlighting um, values in common. And when you, you take that approach um, and focusing on an issue, you really do discover um, that you have more allies around an issue that you may have um, previously considered. So nothing new to add other than that. Great, thank you. Um, and so I wanted to quickly give us another pop quiz here before we wrap up and then in just a second I'll announce our uh, social media winner this afternoon um, as well as next steps but thank you so much to Fran to Karen um, to Marquita for your valuable insights this afternoon I hope that um, our attendees really learned a lot and took away a lot from this afternoon's discussion um, but for our pop quiz question hopefully uh, you all have your are ready to, to put the answer into the chat let me go and find my pop quiz question here but earlier in the discussion, uh, Karen, I believe, mentioned um, five conditions for success. Um, could you all name one of those five elements for a successful partnership? Doesn't have to be verbatim, anything that just kind of is remotely the same. And it looks like uh, Kazmin Ramos, I believe you are a winner. Um, some of the, some of the, those five things were a common agenda or aligned values, um, shared measurement, excuse me, shared measurement system, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and then a backbone of support. So, uh, Kazmin Ramos, if you will submit, send your email to us via the chat, we will send you out a quick prize. I see many more answers coming in, and thank you all for uh, sending answers there. And so, I'm going to find a social media winner. Let me talk to my, my people in the back cage here. And in the meantime, um, stay in touch. We always like for if, if there are additional questions that you had for our speakers that you may not have gotten the answer to today, or if there are some things that you saw on the screen that you know you'd like to follow up on, uh, please feel free to reach out to our speakers offline. Uh, you see Fran, Karen, and Marquita's information there um, as well. So I'm sure they would be happy to answer any additional questions, talk a little bit more about their work, uh, so on and so forth. And then if you all will move along to the next slide for some next steps, 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, another way that you all can win prizes is by uh, filling out our follow-up survey. We always like to know what you all thought about our uh, our Camp Prosperity session. So please complete the follow-up survey. We will randomly select a person to award a prize who uh, will send a prize directly to your email address. So fill out that survey uh, after we wrap up this afternoon. Uh, and then also mark your calendar for our final Camp Prosperity session, the third out of our, excuse me, number three out of our, our three sessions, advocating for equity-centered uh, policies. It is going to be a great discussion. It's happening in uh, two weeks from today on July 30th. We've got some great speakers lined up for you all. Um, and it'll just be a great discussion. Join us then. It's not too late to register. So if you know of additional folks who could benefit from being on our Camp Prosperity series, uh, please send them um, our registration link and get them to join us. And then lastly, uh, Prosperity Now's website is always a great tool for um, additional resources, events. A lot of the resources that Fran mentioned this afternoon can be found on our Prosperity Now website, uh, as well as our Prosperity Now Advocacy Center. Uh, and then the next slide here, as I mentioned all the time, we've got various uh, networks for you all to sign up for if you are interested in going deeper um, and learning more about the work that uh, some of our local partner organizations are doing around the networks that you see there, the topics that you see there, affordable home ownership, racial wealth equity, so on and so forth. Uh, Dara, you can go ahead and flip. I know I am uh, talking probably slower than you would like to flip. Um, and then lastly, taking action with our uh, Prosperity Now campaigns, we have four uh, advocacy issue areas, home ownership, consumer protection, safety net, and then the Turn It Right Side Up tax campaign. Uh, if you're not already a member of those campaigns, I would encourage you to join them to uh, learn more about our policy advocacy efforts as well as taking action. Um, and before I get into the last slide about taking action, I want to just award our social media winner. We didn't have a lot of activity on social media, on Twitter today, but I did want to award someone a prize, uh, and that's gonna be Marie O'Brien. Um, Marie, I don't know your email address, but if you're still on, please send us your email address in the chat. We will send you out a quick prize, uh, but wanna encourage you all to tweet next week for a chance to win a prize from Prosperity Now. Um, and then our last thing that I wanted to mention here, and then I'll turn it over to Fran, Karen, um, to see if you all have any additional closing thoughts here before we close this out. But uh, join our Prosperity Now Advocacy Center if you are not already in it. Um, here you can send emails, tweets, call a member of Congress. It's just a, a very quick and easy one-stop shop place for uh, engaging your legislators. I know that a lot of people want to do more in terms of advocacy, want to chime in on issues that are happening at the federal, state, and local level, but don't really know where to start. This is a great tool for that. It just makes it easy for you to make contact with your legislators, to get to know them a little bit more, to build, uh, start to build relationships with uh, members of Congress, with uh, state, local, and federal members of Congress, as well as their staff. It's free, it's open to Prosperity Now's network, and because you all are in Camp Prosperity, that makes you a part of Prosperity Now's network now. So please take advantage of this free tool that's here for you, um, and it's a, just a great way to involve yourself in some advocacy. Um, and then another uh, thing that I wanted to address is every uh, Camp Prosperity uh, webinar is recorded and, and uploaded to our website. So you can get uh, both the recording as well as the slides on our website um, probably early next week. These next two will be uploaded. So just be on the lookout for those. I know that Fran's, some of Fran's slides have a lot of information on them, and I want to make sure you all have those tools uh, for future use. Um, so with that, I want to uh, see if Fran, Karen, you had any closing thoughts for us this afternoon. And Kimberly, I see that you have a question in the questions box. Um, are there any past or planned webinars on the advanced tax credit? I will, Kimberly, I'm going to have, I'm going to connect you to our policy team um, after Camp Prosperity so that you can follow up with them. Camp Prosperity is not an, intended to be an issue-based series, more of an advocacy skill building series. So we don't focus a whole lot on, on specific issues, um, but our policy team may be planning some additional conversations around the advanced child tax credit. Or if we're not, we can connect you to some uh, to some webinars, some sessions that our national partners are doing. So Kimberly, I'll, I'll reach out to you offline. Thank you for that question. Um, but Fran, um, Karen, any closing thoughts, any additional uh, tips or information for folks on the on the webinar this afternoon? No closing tips. Just wanted to say thank you, everyone, for spending time with us. Thank you, Vanna, for leading us through, and Oliver and Dara for um, all of your support, and, and Karen and Marquita for all of your wisdom sharing. Just really appreciate the time to be with everyone today.
You as well. I just wanted to thank the team. Thank you all um, for joining today. And really feel free to reach out if you do have any follow-up questions um, on developing partnerships. And, uh, and thank you so much. I really do appreciate the opportunity. Great. Thank you both. And thanks to our attendees this afternoon. And Karen, before I wrap up a quick shout out, um, our pop quiz winner, Kasman, is also a results volunteer. So maybe she had a cheat sheet on those five. Uh... Uh, I recognize the name. Congrats, Kasman. <laughs> I'm kidding. But yes, definitely congrats, Kasman. But thank you, everyone, for joining us. I look forward to seeing you all in two weeks where we will talk about advocating for racial uh, equity centered policies. Have a great afternoon and we will talk to you then.